All right, let's make a start then. So, ladies and gentlemen of Pandemic Horde, today I'm going to teach you the basics on how to fleet command. Now, I've mentioned this a couple of times already, so the important thing to remember here is this is not an exhaustive list of what to do and what not to do, because such a list would take far too long. It's not possible. But the idea is to give you the tools and the knowledge you need to actually make a start in either leading fleets yourself or being a secondary fleet commander for other people or at least having a better idea of what the fleet commander is doing so you've got a better idea in your head of what information to provide to him or when it might be appropriate to contact him with particular information, that kind of thing. And we've already got a question, do we get free cookies? No, get your own damn cookies. So, of course, the main question we all need to ask ourselves here is, why would you even fleet command? Why would you put in all that effort, all that time to lead a bunch of other people in a spaceship MMO? Well, because this is an MMO and you are the content generators. The fleet commanders drive this game. It's that simple. And any of you who have been in any Norsec Alliance or Pandemic Horde for a significant period of time, you will know this. The industry guys do a lot of work. The logistics guys do a lot of work. But the fleet commanders are what drives it all forward. It's the ships being lost. It's the fleets going out. The POS is being destroyed. The Fortazars being destroyed. That drives it all. And of course, as the fleet commander, you get to control it all. It's your fleet. You pick what ships, you pick where you go, you pick what to shoot. And this can go all the way up from your 10-man frigate gangs, all the way up to your 250-man battleship fleets. So you're in control. You keep it at a level that you want to do. And this is especially true in Horde, as we'll see in a moment. In other alliances in EVE, in order to lead other people, you need to do particular things. In Horde, this is not the case. This is one of the best things about being here. There are no requirements to lead fleets. At all. You don't need to have a certain level of skills. You don't need to pay people. You don't need to have particular ships, though it helps. You don't need it. And there's no ranking system or tier system affecting what you can and can't do. People come on your fleets because you're good at it. It's that simple. Any of you can post an op on the forum, and I will show you how to do that a little later on. There are no screenshots for that because I don't know how our forums interact with screenshots very well. Spies and all that jazz. But anybody can post an op for whatever you like. It might be a roam. It might be, uh, you know, to gate camp. People have done gate camp fleets before. By all accounts, they're quite fun. It could be a drunk fleet. You can lead a fleet. You can post an op. And to run alongside that, you can ping. You know, you can put pings on Discord now, on IRC. Please use Discord, it's better. And you're in charge, essentially. At any point, you can be in Pandemic Horde for less than a day and start leading fleets, and I encourage you to do so. That's the point of this class. But of course, it's not all easy, because while Horde itself doesn't have any requirements to lead a fleet, you probably want some personal qualities to be a good fleet commander, at least. I've listed them all here, but we'll run through them anyway. So the first one is you've got to have a good microphone. This is incredibly obvious, but the amount of people I hear trying to direct other people with terrible one pound microphones from Poundland, which sound like it's coming through a dial-up connection from 20 years ago. Don't do that. People won't be able to understand you. People won't be able to follow instructions. You'll get frustrated that it's not happening. Other people will get frustrated. If you want to lead fleets on a more serious basis, you need to have a fairly decent microphone. I'm not talking going out and buying a £200 podcast microphone of Amazon, but just something that makes you, you know, audible to people in your fleet. Following on from that, you need to have a decent internet connection. Those of you might remember somebody a couple of months ago who conveniently disconnected whenever he was in a fleet as the commander and everything always went to shit. Don't be that guy, have a decent connection. If you don't, leave fleets by all means, but be aware that you're gonna be at a disadvantage if you keep disconnecting at random moments. Thirdly, you're gonna wanna have a good attitude. And again, this is obvious, but you'd be surprised how often it trips people up. It is incredibly easy in this game to get frustrated and annoyed at things happening around you. We've all done it. 
don't lie if you're saying you're not we've all done it but as a fleet commander as the head of your fleet the person that people listen to all night on and up you want to sound at least relatively positive about what's going on nothing drags your fleet down faster than the guy in charge being negative as all hell to people in the fleet people around the fleet and just generally sounding like an ass that doesn't mean if you're an ass you can't lead fleets it's just gonna mean it's gonna be less fun for everyone involved so having a good attitude is extremely helpful if not required for this kind of thing side by side with that we've got being patient a whole lot of Eva sitting around and doing nothing doubly so if you're in charge because you're the one watching nothing happen and waiting for it all everybody else they'll be sat in comms you know chilling on a stargate whatever it might be but you're in charge you know you're the one sat there waiting for the information to go to come in you're the one seeing it all unfold so being able to sit and wait is very important this is especially true as a new FC, because until you get a better grasp on the mechanics and everything involved with running a fleet, a lot of it's going to be you sitting around trying to figure out what's going on. So you need the ability to sit there and learn and, you know, don't get frustrated that nothing is happening, because that's simply the way it will be sometimes. And of course, you need the ability to learn both from your mistakes and the mistakes of others. This is why after action reports are often a nice thing, because they let you sit down, write out a quick summary of what's happened, a couple of lines, and it makes you realize what happened. You know, where did I go wrong? Where can I improve? If you don't have that attitude, you will forever remain a bad FC. The best FCs are the ones who can learn. Anybody can FC, but yeah, only the good ones actually learn from what they're doing. And that's what you all need to do. But that's all well and good. So what do you actually do as a fleet commander? Well, you do a hell of a lot of things. The list here is not exhaustive for what you do on a fleet. It is not also inclusive. You will not do all of these within a fleet. Particularly in large fleets, you may delegate some of these tasks. But to sum it up, you are responsible for choosing what ships you take. So the fleet doctrine, we'll go over that in a minute, exactly what that means and what that entails. You're responsible for setting up the fleet in the first place, using the fleet window, getting positions set up, squad commander roles, wing roles, fleet adverts. That's all up to you. Once you're out and about, you're in charge of moving the fleet round, positioning it in such a way, both on a grid and in system and on the in-game map to get you where you want to go and achieve what you want to do. That's all up to you. You're leading. You'll also be the one coordinating with your scouts. You'll have scouts out and about. That'll be discussed later. All their information comes to you, and you've got to filter it. You've got to decide what to do. You'll be in charge of setting an anchor in a fight. You'll be in charge of deciding what to shoot and broadcasting that information. And you'll obviously be responsible for analyzing and reacting to whatever is happening. If 20 NC Titans come through right next to you, you are the one responsible for deciding what you do next. Do you stay? Do you run? What do you do? That's up to you. So let's see, say after all that, you still want to lead a fleet. Congratulations, you're the first step up the ladder. But you need to decide one thing and one very important thing. And everything you do is based on this question. What will your fleet be doing? What is it setting out to do? If you can answer this question, you should have a rough idea or be able to get a rough idea on everything else you'll be doing. So stuff like your fleet doctrine, where you start from, how many people you expect or need to have, where you'll be going, how often or how much you advertise your fleet. You know, do you send pings out for hours at a time, Travis? <clears throat> Or do you just send out the one ping because it's a quick roam? Do you not ping at all? Do you post an op on the forums? Do you not? These are things that will be decided by you figuring out what your fleet will be doing. And by that, I mean stuff like, you know, are you going out to shoot a tower? Are you going out for a capital ship fight? Are you going out for a quick roam? Are you going out to hunt down, pwn and play people? You know, these are questions that you need to ask. Once you figure out what you're doing, you need to pick a doctrine. Now, some of you will have heard this term before, some of you might not have. But your doctrine is your blueprint for the fleet. 
So what ships will people in your fleet be bringing? That is your doctrine. And there's a million doctrines in this game. For every ship, there's three different doctrines available for it. So there's a lot available to you. But every doctrine has different strengths. It has different weaknesses. You will generally be picking this long before you go out for the fight. You want to have this in mind before you set up your fleet because you'll be providing this information to people joining your fleet. You've all joined fleets before. You join, people say we need caracals, we need ospreys. It's a caracal doctrine. That's the horde standard caracal doctrine. People say we need canes and ospreys. That's the standard horde artillery cane doctrine. They might say we need cormorants, sniping corms. That's another example of a doctrine. Of course, there are ones that Horde doesn't run. You get Tech 3 Cruiser Doctrines. You get Tower Doctrines, which we do run, but not very often. There's all sorts you can get. And each Doctrine will have particular points you need to bear in mind. And this will go hand in hand with what you intend to achieve as a fleet. So examples include your damage. The amount of damage you deal, you know, if you are in frigates, you're not going to deal a lot of damage. But if you're in battleships, your damage is going to be off the charts. But then, of course, you've got your range of that damage, the application. How much damage do you do? How far can you shoot? How well does that damage even hit? Is that going to be any good for what we're trying to do as a fleet? You know, you don't want to be taking frigates out to bash a pos, for example. You're going to be there for hours, days, years. It's going to be horrible. Then you've got to bear in mind how fast you go. You know, does the doctrine I've pit, does it go quickly? Can I quickly run from a fight? Can I quickly close on a fight if there's an enemy fleet around? How quickly can I close that gap? And of course, you've got to bear in mind we are pandemic horde, ladies and gentlemen. There is a lot of new beans in our fleets. We love them for it. But as a result, you need to bear in mind that lots of people will have low amounts of skill points and can't fly everything on the board or they can't afford everything that you might want to take. So it's no good pinging and getting a fleet up with Tech 3 strategic cruisers when you'll get maybe 20 people who can fly them and 5 people who've got one. So these are all things you need to bear in mind as the commander when you're deciding what fleet you want to take out. And as a result, it's not easy. Some doctrines are quite simply the wrong doctrine to take, and you might not know that till you've already undocked. But other ones you can use as a middle of the road. There's all sorts available. We do have some standard horde doctrines that if you are a first-time fleet commander, I would recommend that you stick to. Examples of these include caracals. I mentioned them earlier, caracals and ospreys. You've all been in a caracal fleet, I imagine. They're effective. They're pretty cheap. They can engage a wide number of targets. They're quite fast. They've got good logistics. You know, it's a nice, cheap, effective doctrine. And this brings me on to a question somebody's asked. Would it be better to start out leading destroyer fleets instead of frigates? Ah, that's entirely up to you. So as an example here, destroyer doctrines. They, um, so towers and cormorants being the two examples that Horde runs. They are quite effective, but at the same time quite hard to FC. The reason being is that they are reliant on range and staying away from the enemy. The long range fit with no tank on the ships. What that means is that you will struggle if you are not very good at keeping people together and away from the enemy because if the enemy gets on top of you, you're dead. So in terms of leading destroyers as a first timer, you can do, I would strongly suggest something like Frigate So. It's a bit smaller, you tend to be a bit more freeform, you tend to be able to get out easier, and it's not so bad if they're on top of you because frigates are pretty much all close range anyway, with the exception of a handful. So again, when you start leading fleets, it's entirely up to you what doctrines you want to take. I would just, you know, bear in mind not only what you're trying to do, but also how easy or difficult it will be for you to do it. If you've never ever been in a cormorant fleet before, for example, I would not advise taking out cormorants as a first-time fleet. Get a bit of a feel with an other SC, see how they work, see how they move, that kind of thing. But yes, destroyers, as a general rule of thumb, do better damage and better application than frigates. That does not make them easier to FC. 
can we invent or use our own doctrine? Yes, you can. However, and this is a big however, there is a huge amount of risk with coming up with your own doctrine that's not widely used or particularly in Horde not used. The first one is, if you are coming up with an idea yourself, you need to have a very good grasp on game mechanics and other doctrines that people use. This is if you're inventing a whole doctrine yourself, essentially. So, when you're inventing a doctrine, you need to basically bear in mind everything that doctrine could fight against. And it's impossible to do that effectively unless you've got a lot of good knowledge previously about other fleet concepts in the game. So you can do it, but it's difficult, and I would not advise doing it unless you've been in this game in a long time, in which case you probably won't be on this class. Um, other factors involved, if you use a non-standard doctrine, as they're often called, is that people simply might not have the ships. You know, it's no good calling for a Myrmidon doctrine with half an hour's notice, because the number of people who have Myrmidons is probably going to be pretty low. So you need to, you know, if you're going to run a non-standard doctrine that people might not have ships for, you want to give plenty of notice to people for this kind of thing. Hopefully that answered that for you. Next question is, if a pilot doesn't have or want to fly a ship in your fleet or in your doctrine, should you allow them to bring a ship at their own risk? Okay, so this is a question you'll run into a lot as an FC. Somebody doesn't have a caracal, can they bring their rupture? Or can they bring their drake, as the meme goes? The short answer is, it's up to you. But it depends on the ship they're wanting to bring and the doctrine you're running. So there are examples where it will not work. For example, if you're taking out cormorants, you don't want somebody in an algos because he's going to do nothing, he's going to be slower, he's going to slow you down. On the other side, running something like a rupture with caracals, while I would not recommend it, can be done. They're roughly the same speed, they can hit out to the same ranges, it's just less effective. What I would usually suggest if you have somebody wanting to bring a ship that doesn't fit with your doctrine is you have them take something more useful in a smaller role, like logistics or electronic warfare or tackle or scout. You know, if the only thing they can offer is a cruiser to your fleet, they've done something wrong because everybody should be able to fly basic frigates, which can fulfill a wide variety of roles. So basically, you're the boss. It's up to you if you let them or not. But you need to bear in mind, will they slow the fleet down? Will their ship be out of range of everybody else in our fleet? Will it be easy for the enemy to catch him, thus making it pointless? Do they have the same tank as the rest of our fleet for our repair ships, for our logistic ships? Usually the answer is no, they do not. And thus I would suggest you tell them to ship to something else. But again, it's up to you. So when you're picking a doctrine for your first time, keep it small. Honestly, keep it small. If you are asking for hurricanes as your first time doctrine as an FC, you've never led a fleet before and suddenly you want to fly hurricanes, I'm telling you now, it will go badly. You want to get your feet wet. You want to get a little bit of experience under your belt with handling people before you start using bigger ships and more people in general. So it's tempting to jump straight into large ships, especially if there's big, bad enemy fleets about, but be aware of your own limits. If you can't coordinate 20 people, how are you going to coordinate 50, 100, 200? That doesn't mean don't, you know, take risks. It means be aware of what you can and can't do, because the fleet falls or stays together based on what you do. But of course, you fly what you want to fly. You're the boss. Fly whatever. Fly Kestrels, fly Rifters, fly Tawars, Cormorants, Catalysts. Fly Ruptures, fly Arbitrators if you want to. Don't know why you would, but you can do. And remember, in any Doctrine, there are a few ships which will always be needed. Examples I mentioned earlier, actually. Scouts, Interdictors, if you're in Nullsec. Logistic ships are pretty much required in 90% of major doctrines nowadays. Electronic warfare is always handy to have. So even if you're running a specialized doctrine, there's nearly always room for something else.
So you've got a doctrine in mind. You've got an idea of what you want to do. What do you do next? You form the fleet. And those of you who have never actually formed a fleet in game might not know where this option is, which is why I'm showing you. Within your fleet window in game, there is a small little option box at the top left. You click on that, you click on form fleet. Congratulations, you've now got a fleet. I mean, you're the only one in it, but you've got one. You're now a fleet commander. But the fleet window isn't exactly the easiest thing to figure out at first glance. And your ability to organize this window and your fleet within it is going to affect how well you can organize your fleet as a whole. So the first thing you want to do, and if you're in game, I suggest you do this now to set it as a default setting, is you want to make sure you set your fleet window to view as hierarchy. And you can get through that at the top left option. This orders the fleet window in such a way where it breaks it down into the fleet, then the wings, then the squads, and then the members in those individual squads. The reason we like to do this is because it lets us quite easily see who's in what position, who can warp who, whether we have leadership bonuses, and this will all be explained in a moment. So, as the first person in your fleet, you are the fleet boss. You have a lovely little star next to your name. It means you're super important. What that means is that you have complete control over this fleet. You can move and remove anybody in it from any position, including the fleet command position. It means you create the fleet advert, the thing that other people see in the fleet finder. It means that you can create and remove squads and wings, as well as we name them all sorts of cool names. And if you quit or disconnect, that will default to either the highest position in the fleet or a random member if everybody is equal. So to start with, your fleet will have just you, which means it will have one wing and one squad. A fleet can hold up to five squads in a wing, five wings in a fleet, and each squad holds 10 people. That means in a single fleet, in terms of how the game organizes it, you can have up to 256 people. That's where it caps out. That is effectively the maximum number of people that you can warp together. Now, you're a long way, I imagine, from leading fleets of that size, but it's important to bear in mind how this functions. The reason it's important to bear in mind is it affects your ability to organize, primarily with the ability to warp people. Now again, those of you in fleets, you will have often been warped without your asking, often by your fleet commander or a squad commander. And this is achieved by people in the commander positions within a fleet being able to warp people directly under their command and no further. So somebody in a squad command position can only warp people in their squad. That's up to 10 people including themselves. People in a wing can walk the whole wing, that's up to 50 people. And the person at the top of the hierarchy list, which is not necessarily the boss, can walk the whole fleet. Now the way that fleet warps work is it will only walk people who you are in space with on a grid. So if you initiate a fleet warp as the fleet commander in the fleet command position, it will not walk people who are on a stargate on the other side of the system. They won't even notice. And again, this is something else to bear in mind. When you initiate a fleet warp, it will only warp people with you there in space that you can see on your overview or who are cloaked in the same area. It will not warp people who are already in warp, obviously, and it will not warp people who are not there. These are things you need to bear in mind to make sure your fleet does not get broken up. The last thing you want to do is start fleet warping people, say, after jumping through a gate. And not everybody's in system yet, so not everybody gets fleet warped, people are left behind. It's all very sad, people might die. Fleet warps themselves can be interrupted through any normal way of disrupting a fleet warp. So anybody who's warp disrupted, anybody who's in a warp disruption bubble, they will not be warped. It's as simple as that. It's pretty obvious, but it's worth bearing in mind. If you do a fleet warp, with half of your fleet inside a warp bubble, that half of the fleet is not going anywhere, even if you warp. Once you set up your squads and your wings how you like, it's time to open up your fleet to the Horde public, essentially. And you do that by creating a fleet advert. 
Fortunately, this is super easy, even though it might appear a bit overwhelming. Simply click the option at the top left of your window, create advert, and voila, you've got a window there to name your fleet. And you'll have several options at the bottom related to who can see the advert. Now, in the screenshot I provided here, it shows you the settings that I use. These are the settings I would suggest you default to. What this will basically allow is it will allow people in your core, Pandemic Horde, people in your alliance, Pandemic Horde again, and people who are excellent standing to us, that's plus 10 standing. Now you can change that to say good, the little radio button near the bottom. That means people plus five and above can see the fleet. That's up to you. I just use plus 10, that is people from Honor, people from PL, from Waffles, CR fleets, and join in. And for obvious reasons, you probably want that. I would also recommend you tick the option at the bottom to hide details in an advert. What that means is when you look at a fleet advert, by default, it will show you the fleet name, how many people are in it, and where they are. You probably don't want them to see all of that. So if you tick that box, that will hide how many is in the fleet and where you are at the moment. Horde is full of spies, ladies and gentlemen. It's a simple fact of being the corporation we are, open to everybody. So every step we can take to make it a little more secure is always nice to do. Once you've entered that information, you just hit on Submit and your fleet will appear in the Fleet Finder for anybody to join within Horde or any of our allies. And obviously, they just join your fleet. You tell people you've got a fleet, they join in. Hooray, you've got people. One thing I also recommend you do is you set a fleet message of the day. And honestly, this is some of the last of the boring admin stuff, guys, so stick with me here. The reason I suggest setting a fleet message of the day is it communicates key information to people in the fleet or joining the fleet as to what you want. So in the message of the day, when they join the fleet, the fleet window opens for them, the chat window, they obviously see the information that you've set right there. So I suggest including information like what ships you want, what mumble channel you're using for your fleet, Alpha, Delta, Bravo, so on and any other information you feel might be relevant, such as Logi Cap channels, as a good example here. Maybe who to watch list, that's up to you. But I would suggest at least including what ships you want and what Mumble comes to join. That way, people don't ask a million times. They probably still will anyway, but at least this way you can point to the MOTD. So, you've got a fleet, you've got people in it, you've got people joining it, you've picked a doctrine, you've got a rough idea of what you want to do. What next? You need to figure out what you're going to fly. Because as a fleet commander, you don't want to fly a normal ship. No siree, you're very special, you're very important. If you die, your whole fleet goes to pot, or at least it takes a little while to organise. So, as a fleet commander, you want to fit a ship that's got the maximum possible tank. Because if you get shot, you want to live, is the long and the short of it. The damage that you put out as a fleet commander is not important compared to you staying alive. So if you are in a position where you need to fit a, you know, a better tank on your ship, and you can't because you've got all these nice power grid loving guns in the high slots, you take off some of those guns. You fit a bigger tank. Because if you die, your entire fleet's got to reform to figure out who's next in charge. Or maybe they don't, maybe they just fall apart because you died. So, max tank. That's the first thing to bear in mind. The second thing to bear in mind is you need to be able to keep up with your fleet because you'll be leading the fleet as an anchor and we'll be showing you that in a minute. So, you can't afford to not have a propulsion mod. You need to keep up with the rest of your fleet. So normally you will fit a similar ship you don't want to fit a battleship, for example, if the rest of your fleet is in destroyers. That's dumb. Don't do that. He'll be sat stationary while your fleet buzzes around you. Don't do that. In the screenshot here, that is a caracal that I use for our caracal doctrine. Caracals and ospreys, that's the one I fly. So it's not a fancy heavy interdictor with the huge tank bonus it offers. It's not a command ship. 
This is just a normal caracal that I've stripped out some of the mods on to help increase its survivability and include a probe launcher. Now, probe launching is something that's a bit more advanced. I won't be covering too much in this class, but note that in the future, you are going to want the ability to use probes to scan down enemy ships and warp your fleet directly to them. Now, don't stress too about that too much at the moment. I consider that to be, while not advanced tactics, certainly more important than the information here. But it's something you'll need to bear in mind. At some point, your FC ship will have a probe launcher on it, and you need to bear this in mind when fitting it. That's why I have co-processors on that ship. What is a good FC ship to aim for in the future? The answer to that question is, it depends on the rest of your doctrine, the rest of your fleet. So, there is no perfect FC ship that will fit every scenario. There are ships that will perform well for a majority of doctrines and a majority of fleets, but there is not one particular ship you should be training for. What I would usually recommend is make sure that you can fly a tankier version of the ship that is your main doctrine ship. So Caracals being the example here, fit either a tanky Caracal or, if you have the skills for it, and the ISK, something like an Onyx. Now, an Onyx is a Tech 2 cruiser. It's a heavy interdictor. Its main role is to put up warp disruption bubbles and tackle super capital ships. But its main, or its bonus that you're interested in, is the fact that it's got a tank bonus built into the ship. It gets humongous amounts of health and resist compared to another cruiser. So while it's a bit more expensive, something like an Onyx is a pretty decent ship to lead Caracals from because it's a lot tankier and it can keep up with the Caracals. Again, your ability to deal damage is not majorly important. This is all changing in a few months. Less than that. As some of you know, in November, we are getting a huge sweeping change by CCP to command links. Now, command links as they stand at the moment aren't covered in this class, but I'll cover them now briefly because this is something that came up fairly recently. Command links at the moment basically give your fleet huge bonuses to shield, to speed, to point range, to web range, to tank, this kind of thing. At the moment, they work by having a ship with command links somewhere in space in the system you're fighting in, probably AFK. It's not important. It's not something you worry about as a new BSC. It's not something you worry about till a much later stage. Okay. However, links in November are going to become a lot more important. They're going to be what we call on-grid. So at the moment, the way links work is they apply anywhere in system. Okay. So the link ship can be anywhere else in the solar system. But come November, they will need to be with your fleet in the fleet, on the grid. Links will be an area of effect weapon, and this affects you as an FC. Because the kind of ships that field command links, which are command ships and destroyers and battle cruisers can actually fit them as well, are the sorts of ships you'll probably be flying in big, expensive doctrines. Command ships are tech to battle cruisers. They're hilariously tanky, very hard to kill. They will fit command links in November. They already do, but they'll fit them more in November. So those are the kinds of ships you may also consider training for. Command ships, Tech 2 destroyers, battle cruisers. They all field links. They will all be much more important come November. But for now, concentrate on just staying alive. Don't worry about links, anything like that. Staying alive is key as the FC. Is there a risk to get headshot if you fly a different ship? Yes, there is. There is a very real risk you will be identified earlier as the fleet commander if you're the only one in a different ship in the middle of the enemy fleet, or in the middle of your fleet, as the case may be. This is why, if you fly a ship that's not the same as your main set, so for example, if you choose not to fly a Caracal in a Caracal fleet, you need to fly something that has the tank to offset the increased risk. The Onyx was the example I mentioned earlier. The Onyx fits huge amounts. I can actually tell you, so a caracal, you're looking at about 
30 to 40,000 EHP with your resists on, right? And Onyx, you're looking anywhere up to 100,000. Possibly more if you've got links or overheating your mods. So you're basically getting three to four times the effective health, which I would say is well worth the trade off. Especially if you've got enough repair ships, you are essentially unkillable, and any time the enemy spends shooting you is time absolutely wasted because they don't kill you and they don't kill any of the things shooting them back. Which is, again, another thing you need to bear in mind when leading fleets. If you're trying to kill the enemy fleet commander, assume he is thinking along these lines. Assume he's in something tanky that'll be hard to kill. Maybe you're wasting your time shooting him. Maybe you're not. Not everybody flies a tanky ship, but they probably should. So, let's say you've got an idea what you want to fly, you've got people in your fleet, you know sort of what you want to do, you've got an objective in mind, you're going to go for a bit of a roam. You know, you're going to go a couple of jumps, see what you can find. Well, then you're going to want some scouts, ladies and gentlemen, and I'm trying not to sugarcoat it here, scouts are possibly your most valuable asset as a fleet commander. You are one man or woman, you're one person, you cannot see everywhere, no matter how hard you try. That's what your scouts are for. And by extension, recon as well. So your scouts will generally be in interceptors. They can move quickly. They will dart around where you need them to. They will follow your route ahead of your fleet. They will follow behind your fleet. They will check the systems next door. And they will be telling you everything and anything of importance. They'll look for enemy fleets. They'll tell you if there's camps in front of you. They'll tell you if there's bubbles so you don't all land in a warp disruption bubble. In a fight, they can get close to the enemy fleet to let you warp in. They might get away from the enemy fleet to let you warp out. If you are in a fleet any larger than 10 people and you do not have a scout, I will be very disappointed in you. If you do not have a scout, get one. Ask in your fleet. Guys, we need a scout. We can't go anywhere unless we got one. Do I have anybody willing to volunteer? Yes, me, I see our scout. Brilliant, away you go. You don't need more than one, but more than one is nice. Especially if the first one dies. Your scouts are not invincible. They will make mistakes. They will explode from time to time. Having a backup scout is nice. If you go out without scouts, you are basically flying blind. You don't know what's ahead of you. You don't know what's behind you. Don't go without a scout. In terms of communicating with your scouts, on Mumble, you will usually be sat in a separate channel to the rest of your fleet. You've probably seen it in action. If you look down in Mumble at our various comms channels, you'll see for all of the Alpha, Delta, and so on, there is the actual Alpha channel, and then there's a sub-channel for Main, and that's where people in your fleet sit. As the fleet commander, you sit in the channel just above, the Main Charlie channel, or the Main Delta channel, and your scout joins you in there. And that means you can talk to each other using your local whisper keys, like I'm using now, without talking to the rest of the fleet, using your shout keys. Of course, you might want to also do it with in-game chat. It might be easier for you to see the information. It's up to you how you talk to your scout, but you need to make sure you've got a line to them, however you do it. Your scout providing you intel at crucial moments will save your fleet, and it will save you. To expand on that, you want to know who your good scouts are. Get to know people who step up and scout. Know that you can rely on them in the future. Hey, it's, you know, so-and-so. You scouted for me last time. You were pretty good. You want to do it again? Yeah, sure. Great. And you know you can rely on them. They've done it before. They've given you good information. You want to build a rapport with the scouts that you often fly with. Because that way they know what information to provide you. They've flown with you before. They know what you're looking for. And likewise, you know that the information they provide you is going to be accurate. Now, your scouts can only check where you're going. So it's important for you to figure out where that is. And for this matter, I'm going to tell you this. And for those of you who have never seen Doc Landis, is going to come as a shock. Do not use the in-game map to plan your routes. It is that simple. The in-game map is absolutely haram. Do not use it. 
It is horrible to navigate, especially if you've got the beta one. It does not give you information in a clear, easy to see manner. You can use it, by all means use it, but do not rely upon it. Do not plan your routes with it. Dotlan is a website that pretty much everybody in this game uses, and you'll find yourself using it as well. As you can see here, in the screenshot, it lays out every system in the region in a really easy to use fashion. It's nice, it's organized, you can see at a glance where stuff is. The mapping question here, this is pure blind. This is where we are now in 7RM, which is the highlighted system. You can easily see what connects to what, what's a dead end system, how to get to X, Y, and Z. It will also let you put in filters. You can filter for ships killed within the last day. You can filter for NPCs killed within the last day. The number of jumps. See how busy somewhere is. This kind of information is obviously extremely valuable to you because you can effectively use it to figure out where a hotspot may or may not be. And of course, it lets you easily parse information at a glance. If your scout says, I'm over in ROI, and you have no idea where that is, and you're desperately searching through the in-game map to figure out where it is, whatever information your scouts just provided to you will be useless by the time you figure it out. Whereas you look at dot line here, which you saw ROI is three jumps away, just to the up and right of 7RM. Easy to see. Use dot line. If you have two screens, that's what your second screen's for. Throw dot line on it. It will also let you plan routes. There's a navigation tool built into the top bar. Go on to there, you can put your routes in, much like you do in EVE. And it will give you routes through the game. It will let you see what security they are. It will let you change to alternate routes. You can avoid routes, much like in game. All of that fun jazz. So yes, learn to love it, gentlemen. You'll be using it a lot. So let's recap. You're in a fleet, you're in a ship. Your fleet are in ships. You know where you're going. You've got scouts. You found something to fight. How do you get them to fight you? This is the tricky question. And if you find a 100% guaranteed answer, I will eat my hat. I will buy a hat and eat it. But if you're initiating a fight against an enemy fleet, there are many things you need to bear in mind. Eve is like a big game of chess. The fight is often won before the piece is moved. Usually going into a flight, both fleet commanders will have a fairly realistic expectation of the outcome. Dependent on what you're flying, dependent on what they're flying, how you engage, these will all determine the outcome often before a fight even begins. That does not mean that any fight is a foregone loss. Don't get discouraged. Anything can happen in a flight. In a fight, you can have poor target calling, poor logi. You can have bombs come in. You can have... Micro jump drives activate, you can have a Sino go up, anything can happen in a fight. But you need to bear in mind, if the enemy is really easy to engage you, eager to engage you, I should say, consider why. Why are they so eager to fight us? Do they think they'll win? Why is that? You know, what do they know that I do not? Maybe they are just looking for a fight, maybe they're looking to die and go home. But more often than not, they've got something else up their sleeve. Now, if you're chasing a fleet, or if a fleet is chasing you, you've got a number of tactics available that you should bear in mind. Warp disruption bubbles are incredibly good for impeding movement, both your fleet and their fleet. You can use the terrain to your advantage, which sounds weird, but when we were looking at Dotland on the previous slide, you notice many systems only had one way in or out, or only one of the system linked to. Use that to your advantage. If you hide in that kind of system, the enemy know that they've got to, that you've got to go through them to get out. So they're probably more eager to engage. They think they've got you trapped. Likewise, you can trap an enemy fleet into a system if you know what you're doing. Again, this will not always happen. Eve is unpredictable. People are unpredictable. But you should be using every advantage you can to get that fight. However, do not be afraid about not fighting. There are fights which you will not be able to win. No matter how good you are, no matter how good your pilots are, there are fights which you will not be able to win based on your fleet. There is nothing wrong with not fighting. And don't let anybody tell you otherwise. 
There is no point in running into a fight knowing it's a 100% guaranteed loss for no kills. Nobody enjoys that. If you think it's, you know, a low chance of winning, but you think you can still get away with it, do it. Absolutely go nuts. But do not be afraid about disengaging or leaving. So let's say you haven't run away. You're now in a fight. This is it. Everything you've planned for. All of your decisions on what to fly. All of your decisions on what to do, where to go. It all comes down to this fight right here. So what is the first thing you need to do as the FC? You need to anchor up. And anchoring is very important. If you're anything above... I, again, I'd say really anything above 5 to 10 pilots, you're going to want to anchor. The reason you do this is, as the commander, you will obviously be looking at the fight and judging what needs to be done. What needs to be shot? Where we need to go? Do we need to run? Do we need to move closer? Do we need to move away? And it's very hard to do that if everybody is just flying around doing their own thing. You don't know where people are. You don't know if they're in range of what you want to shoot. You don't know if they're in range of your repair ships, if you've got logistics. So, anchoring up. Essentially, long story short, they keep their ships next to yours. You are the anchor. They are the ships, you're the anchor, they stay close to you. You move around, they follow you. They being your fleet, obviously. You move closer to the enemy fleet, your fleet moves closer. You move away, they move away. This gives you the advantage to know that if you are in range of something, so is the rest of your fleet, so are all your caracals, or your hurricanes, or your towers, or your cormorants, or your rifters. You know that if they're around you, and you're close enough, they're close enough. Which means you can go, shoot that guy, and that guy gets shot. You know that if you are too far away, the rest of your fleet is too far away. And likewise, trying to shoot that guy is not going to work. Now, you will not be the only anchor, and there are some fleets where, as the commander, you might not be the anchor. Large fights, this is quite common, you might have somebody else as your main anchor for your main line ships, for your caracals, for your hurricanes, for your maelstroms, for your tempests, whatever it might be. There will also, in 90% of fleets involving logistics ships, there will be a logistics anchor as well for your repair ships. The reason being is you do not want your repair ships close to the enemy. So if you're close to the enemy, you don't want your repair ships there. You want them behind you, nice and safe. So if you are planning to have a large amount of repair ships in your fleet, Osprey, Scythe, that kind of thing, I would make sure that you have a logistics anchor in advance. And that will more often than not be another logistics guy stepping up to the plate and being, yes, I will anchor. And that guy will be doing the same thing as you. He'll be keeping the repair ships in range of you, are out of range of the enemy. So, we have a question here. Some FCs don't call for specific anchor approach keep at range. In that scenario, use your own judgment. To be honest, guys, the keep at range orbit and approaching the FC methods of anchoring, they have very little practical difference. There are some nuances, don't get me wrong, before people start arguing specific points, but in general, they all do the same thing. They keep you close to the anchored ship. So if your FC doesn't say orbit, keep at range approach. If they just say anchor on me, do whichever. Get close to your fleet commander and stay on it. That's the important thing. And likewise, as the commander, you don't have to call a specific one. Just say, guys, anchor on me, TGL3, get close, anchor up. Your fleet comes to you, you start moving, they're moving with you. You're going. The other thing to bear in mind is your propulsion mods, your afterburners, your micro warp drives. If you as the FC suddenly activate your afterburner and you do not tell the people following you, they will fall behind and very suddenly you are not the anchor. Your fleet is 20 kilometers away, nothing's in range, everything's going wrong. So if you are the anchor as the commander, make sure you are telling people when and when not to use the afterburners and micro warp drives. This is the same for anybody who anchors at any point. Make sure you bear this in mind. Otherwise, you get people falling behind because they're not using their mods. So, you've got your fleet anchored up. They're following you. That's great. What next? Well, you need to bear in mind what you're trying to do. So, as you go through the fight, 
you need to bear in mind stuff like your fleet ranges. How far can your fleet shoot? How far can the enemy fleet shoot? How far can your repair ships repair? Now, again, this is something that the other logistics anchor will be dealing with, but it's something you need to bear in mind. Am I getting too far away from our repair ships? Are the enemy fleet getting too far away from their repair ships? You also need to be bearing in mind other things as well. You need to be bearing in mind, is there places nearby I can walk to if I need to? Is there places nearby that the enemy will walk to if they need to, or they could walk in from? Do I have scouts here? Are they nice and far away? Can I walk to them to get off the, you know, out of danger? Can I walk to them to get closer to the enemy? So it's not just a case of moving your fleet round all willy-nilly. You need to bear in mind where your fleet is going. You also want to keep an eye out for enemy interdictors. Those are the ships that drop the nasty warp disruption bubbles. Is there one in front of my fleet? Is there one behind me trying to catch up? Can we shoot it? Can we eliminate that threat? And of course, all the time, guys, the enemy are doing this as well. You're both dancing around each other, trying to get the best positioning you can. Sometimes it will go in your favor, sometimes it won't. Decide if it's not going in your favor, do you call it quits? Do you warp away? If you can't get close enough to the enemy fleet to shoot them, why are you there? Get off grid. Leave. There's no shame in doing so. The alternative is dying. And now we get to the fun bit, deciding what to shoot and how to shoot it. Target calling. This is one of the more active parts of being a fleet commander in a fight. So you're not just moving your guys around. You're telling them what to shoot at. Now this will normally be done, much as I am now. You will do it through voice chat. It will also be done through target broadcasting, which is an in-game mechanic. When you are telling your fleet what to shoot, it is often a good idea to give them a primary target and a secondary target. The reason being is that if the primary target is dead or about to die or it's out of range of some of your fleet, they can still shoot the secondary knowing that it's a good thing to shoot. And likewise, when the primary dies, the secondary takes over as the new primary and you pick a new target as the secondary. This is difficult and we'll discuss what to shoot in a minute. But this is a difficult part to being a fleet commander. Choosing what to shoot in a quick amount of time is hard, especially if you do not know a lot of what particular ships and ship types can do. So do not stress. This is a difficult thing. Now, once you've decided what you want your fleet to shoot, this is how you do it. In a large fight, you will often be using the broadcast window. And for you, as the FC, this couldn't be simpler. You hold down the X button on your keyboard, and you click the target. Congratulations, you've just broadcast the target to your entire fleet. You can rebind that key, by the way, in the control settings. It's not always X, but by default, it's X. The other way to call a target is to say it on comms. So, for example, using me, TGL, in the caracal, is your primary. Bam. Now, the disadvantage of that is that you've only told your fleet what to shoot. They don't see it in the broadcast window. They've got to look through their overview to find that target. The advantage of broadcasting a target using the X button means that they can quickly click on the target and start locking it. They don't have to go searching. The best tactic for this is to do both of these at once. So you broadcast a target with the X key and you say it on comms for clarification. So people can quickly find the target because you've broadcast it but they've also heard you say the target, so they're confirming that that target is the right thing to shoot. It also stresses which broadcast they're shooting. If you broadcast multiple targets at once, which you might well do, it gives them an order of priority on what to shoot if you're calling it out as well. And again, this is easy to mess up. I mispronounce names all the time when I'm target calling, for example. I talk too quickly. It's a terrible personality trait of mine. So don't worry too much. As long as your fleet are getting the idea of what to shoot, that's the important thing. Get that information to your guys. And of course, if you're all shooting something and it's quite simply not dying, don't be afraid to change it. 
telling your fleet to shoot something does not lock them into shooting something forever. Change targets. You are allowed to do this. New information might be available. There might be new ships to shoot. Something else might be in range. Change the primary target if you have to. Just make sure you tell people you're doing it. And of course, what do you shoot? Well, again, this is one of those tricky questions. There's no answer which is going to be correct all of the time. In general, however, you want to eliminate the enemy of what we call their force multipliers. So these are ships whose effectiveness goes beyond just being a ship. So examples of this are electronic warfare, stuff that is ECMing your fleet or sensor dampening or target painting, stuff that is vastly increasing the effectiveness of their fleet or reducing the effectiveness as yours beyond normal damage. Those are usually the best targets to hit first. In addition, they're also pretty weak as a general rule of thumb. Electronic warfare ships don't tend to be that tough. So they're usually nice, easy kills that will drastically improve your situation. Logistics, of course, enemy repair ships are a good thing to shoot. If you're realizing that you are not killing their main ships because there's too much repair coming in, go kill their logistic ships. See if you can kill those. Reduce the amount of repair available to them. And if they have them there, command ships and command destroyers, we mentioned these earlier, in November they will be there. But at the moment, you're unlikely to see these in the middle of an enemy fleet. But if you see them, they have a lot of tank. But again, they'll be providing a bonus to ships nearby. So eliminating them early is often a good move. And of course, you need to take into account what your fleet is, what ships you have, your ability to actually kill what you want to kill. So the classic example here is you're in a battleship fleet. You don't want your guys shooting frigates. Okay, you're never going to hit them. Your huge battleship guns are never going to track the frigate. Ordering your guys to shoot them is 99.9% .9 waste of percent of the time a waste of your time. On the other side of the coin, shooting battleships with frigates, where well, you're going to hit them, but you're not going to do a lot of damage in frigates. So unless you've got a critical mass of frigates, you know, you've got a lot of dudes, or they haven't got a lot of repairs or a lot of battleships, maybe there's only one or two of them, you know, you probably don't want to be doing that. So when choosing targets, take into account your ability to actually kill something. If you haven't got the damage, don't attack that target if you know you can't kill it. You're just wasting ammo. And of course, avoid tunnel vision. Those of you who have played first-person shooters and racing games will be all too aware of this. Don't get too fixated on killing one target. This is particularly if the target is running away or getting out of range or getting a lot of repairs. Don't fixate too much on one guy. And finally, this is the most important point here. Shooting anything is better than shooting nothing. If you are unsure what to shoot as a fleet commander, pick something, anything. You can change your mind once you started shooting. But time spent not shooting is essentially wasted. You're not doing anything. You're just sitting there, probably taking return fire. So if you're panicking, if you can't decide what to shoot, don't stress, calm it down. Pick something to start with, something close, get people shooting, get something going while you keep looking for other ideal targets, okay? The biggest mistake you can make is doing nothing. So here we've got a question, drones on main DPS to break reps. Okay, so drones is a good question to ask. Um, in a lot of fleets, drones are a supplementary form of damage from your fleet so for example caracals you have two drones they deal very little damage let's be honest here they'll do you know 20 to 40 dps depending on your skills however that you know added up over 100 people is still a significant boost in damage so what you do with drones is usually dependent on what you're fighting drones are very good at killing small stuff so a common tactic used is to tell people to put their drones on, for example, enemy tackle or enemy electronic warfare, just to grind them down a bit or force them away. You might not kill them, but you reduce them as a threat.
But if you need the damage, if you are struggling to kill something, putting all the drones on the primary is often a good idea. I would not suggest putting drones on a secondary simply because that clues into that target that you're about to start attacking him because he's already taking damage from drones. So in general, your drones are going to be either on the primary target or on like enemy electronic warfare and fast tackle. It's very rare you'll be putting it on a secondary. This is especially if you're in a drone fleet. So if you're using Gila's, being a good example here, drones are your DPS, so they will be on the primary. That's not up for debate. They are how you deal damage, so you cannot do it any other way. But yes, usually drones will just be flying around all, all over the place. You know, people forget where they are, what they're doing. If you have the time and you remember, sure, remind people to put them on a particular target. But drone damage is relatively light. Don't stress too much. So, assuming you followed all of that, congratulations, you fought your first fight and you may or may not have won. In all honesty, you probably won't have, but that's part of the learning process. So, what else do you need to bear in mind? Many things, unfortunately. Being a good fleet commander is not something you're going to learn in a class. It is something you're going to pick up over time, learning from other people, learning from your mistakes, and learning from what you do well. But, if I had to give you some advice, it would be what I'm putting here. Step number one. Build relationships with your fleet, with people in Horde and around it. Horde is a corporation that is constantly growing. Its open door attitude means that people are leaving and joining every day. Okay, The people you are flying with today may not be here tomorrow, and there may be people on your fleet tomorrow you've never seen before. But there are people who stick about. I'm one of them, for example. Many of your FCs have been here a while. Many of your scouts, many of your logistics are more dedicated pilots and are more likely to be within the Horde for a longer period of time. So get to know them. Get to know who can do what, who you can just trust to achieve certain tasks. We use scouts earlier as, a, as an example. Logistics pilots, boosters, capital pilots, if you're bringing in capital ships, you know, dicta pilots. Get to know who can do what, you know, who you can reliably call upon. If you know other fleet commanders, you know, know that you can ask them for advice. What do I do here? What ships do you recommend I take? Can you come on my fleet and give me advice if it all goes wrong? Great, yes, absolutely, not a problem. And likewise, you want to be teaching your fleet as much as they're teaching you. So if somebody wants to scout, if they think they have the skills, let them. You know, if you, if you have room for a scout, absolutely let them. People don't get better by not doing anything. They get better by doing, much as you are. So let people do what they want to do in a way that helps you and them. And again, if you're running a doctrine that's unfamiliar to you or your fleet, or it's a new doctrine, perhaps, maybe we've just brought out Gila's, for example, explain how it works before you go out. Hmm? You don't want people in the middle of the fight asking how their ship works or what they should be doing. So teach people. And if you're not sure yourself, ask somebody else for help. There's thousands of people in this corporation who will help you. If you're about to pull some complicated shit, if you're about to start using probe, or if you want to split the fleet up for whatever reason, maybe you want to go in two directions at once to catch the enemy, explain it. Be thorough. Let people know what you are doing. Obviously, if there's information you need to keep secret, you know, keep it secret. But a confused fleet is a dead fleet. People who don't know what they're doing and are in the wrong place, they don't know what they're shooting, you know, you, you're going to die. So don't necessarily tell people everything, but tell them enough so that they are effective. Point number three. Because Horde has such a wide range of pilots, from one-day-old new beans all the way up to five-year-old bitter vets, these are things you need to bear in mind. People will have different maximum speeds. They will have different damage output. They will have different capacitor. These are all things their skills will affect. So 
do not assume that just because you are an elite tier person with 80 million SP, you can fly every ship, you've got perfect fitting skills. Not everybody else will. There are very few doctrines which will be hugely impacted by this, but it's something that you, as the leader, need to remember. Point number four, I've mentioned this before and I'm mentioning it again. Don't be afraid to leave, run away, extract. Fighting to the death is all very well and fun, but if it's pointless, why are you doing it? Okay, This is personal preference, however. If you want to stay and fight, you stay and fight. But just remember, are you helping anybody by doing it? You know, if you're never going to get out alive anyway, you know, stay with your fleet and fight. But if you are not, if you can get away with 75% of your fleet intact, because you're going to lose anyway, no harm in doing so. Get people home, they get to keep their ships, and they don't die for no reason, everybody's happy. Now, as the commander, you will notice a lot of mistakes being made. You are at the top of the fleet, everything you see is what impacts the battle so you will see people mess up you will see people walk to the wrong place you will see people anchor incorrectly shooting the wrong targets maybe dropping a bubble in the wrong place you will see all this and more and you'll do it yourself you will make mistakes the important thing is and this goes hand in hand with the positive attitude comment at the start if you berate and scream and yell at people for making honest simple mistakes those people will A, not learn, and B, are much less likely to join you in the future. And you end up two weeks down the line running a fleet and only two people will join you because you are a dick to everybody else. Now that does not mean you can't be harsh. You are the boss. If somebody's fucking up or disobeying you, you can call them out. Kick them from the fleet. Do what you've got to do. But where you can, please educate. Tell people why what they did was wrong and how they can avoid it in the future. Otherwise, they're just going to make the same mistake again for you, for somebody else, for another FC. They now have to deal with somebody who's angry at the other FC. They still don't know how to do what they want to do. They're going to make the same mistake again. This does not mean you're a teacher, though, okay? So, you know, don't feel pressured to explain every little thing. But if there are significant mistakes that bother you, please point them out to people in a way that will help avoid it happening again. And this can be hard to do. If you've just lost 200 men, 200 ships, because somebody fucked up, let them know they fucked up. You know, there is no shame in saying, hey, you, you fucked this up. But here's why you fucked it up, so we can stop it happening again. You can be angry at them, but make sure they know why you're angry and you're not just screaming incoherently about having two fucking dictators or something like Pro God Legend. Don't do that. And in addition, you as a fleet commander can make no mistakes. You could be flawless. Everything you did today was perfect, but you still lost. It happens. Taken on the chin. The mistake might have been somebody else's. Maybe you just got outplayed without you actually fucking something up. It happens, okay? And when you're learning, when you're starting out, this is so so important because it's extremely easy to come off after your first fleet you've just lost you got one kill you lost 20 people it's horrible i feel terrible all these people died because of me don't sweat it you're new you know you, you maybe you've barely started in the game you've never led a fleet before nobody's going to hold this against you and if they do we don't really want them here anyway So, let's sum it all up, gentlemen, because I've been talking for a long time and you're probably getting quite tired of my voice. You're in a fleet. You're the fleet commander. Make your decisions quickly. This applies to target calling. It applies to moving around. It occurs to deciding what you're doing. If you are silent and bad things are happening, if the fleet hears nothing coming from you, they will lose confidence. They will not be happy. They won't know what to do. Tell your fleet what you're doing. Decide something. Change your mind if you have to after, but decide on something. Warp somewhere. Shoot something. Anchor up. Move. Decisions keep the fleet moving. And again, keep your fleet informed. Don't leave them confused. Repeat what you're doing. Repeat it again and then say it again. Primary is XYZ. Secondary is YXZ. 
primary is, secondary is, primary is, secondary is. It's dead. Great. Your new primary is X, Y, Z. Your new primary is X, Y, Z. Repeat it. Keep people going. Warp to this gate. 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 So on. Make sure people know. If you say one, if you say your order once and somebody wasn't listening, maybe, you know, there was another noise or somebody else was speaking or your mic cut out. You know, how do you know that order got through? Are you then going to be mad that somebody didn't follow your instructions when it wasn't their fault? Repeat your orders. Point number three, have a plan. Any plan is a good plan. This goes hand in hand with making a decision. If you are just sat there not knowing what you're doing and not knowing what you're trying to achieve, you know, what are you doing? Why are you there? Why are you in space? Why are you playing this game? Have a plan. It could be anything. The plan could be to go shoot those caracals. It could be to go kill Brave. It could be to go to roam to that pocket and kill the people killing our miners in GMA. It could be to go kill an NPC Dreadnought. I don't care. Have a plan in mind, a goal you want to achieve, and then move towards that goal. You might not achieve the goal, but move towards it. Number four, ask for help. We are here. Your horde, your brothers in arms. You may move on from this corporation, but while you are here, we will help you. There is a slide in a minute showing you exactly how we can help you. But ask for advice, ask for help, ask for ships to hand out. All sorts of things at your disposal. You have Pandemic Legion and Waffles allied to us. Those guys are hugely experienced at the game. You'll see them on Discord, you'll see them on IRC, you'll see them in chat channels. Ask them for help. If they can't help you, they can't help you, but ask away anyway. They love new beans. They love Horde. We're like the little kid. They love helping you. Point five, your ego. It's not important. I don't care about how smug or arrogant you are or how good you think you are as a pilot or an FC. There is somebody better. There is somebody who does what you're trying to do in a better way in this game, much like real life, actually, if you want to get depressed. There is somebody better at what you are trying to do. There will be an FC you run into in a fight that is better in every way. They can anticipate what you're doing. They know how to counter your ships. They know what exactly what to shoot to wipe you out the quicker. No matter how long you play this game, somebody will be better. The important thing you can do is keep improving on what you do. Every fleet you do, think, what did I do well? What did I do poorly? How can I do better? Is there something I'm missing? Do I, am I having trouble calling targets? Am I freezing up? You know, am, am I having trouble deciding what to shoot? Am I having trouble keeping my fleet together? These kind of things. So always keep improving. And point number six, go for it, lads. Like I said at the start, Horde has no requirements. We don't care if you're a day one old new bean. Get people together, go out, have fun. That's all we can really ask. If you can get better while you're doing it, that's fantastic. You'll be a career FC in no time. But until that point, go out and do what you want to do. Now, I said this was a simple overview. There are many more advanced things that in the future you will start coming across. You will see reference and that you want to improve yourself at. So in the left common, we've got terms and concepts that as a fleet commander, I do not expect you to deal with as a new FC, but these are concepts and fleet ideas and mechanics that you will deal with in the future if you keep leading fleets. So we've got probes, I mentioned them earlier. They're not that advanced to use, which is why they're at the top, but Using probes is something you want to start doing once you start leading full fleets because it simply improves how quickly you can move around. Warfare links, again, they're changing in November, so keep an eye out around that time for developer blogs. There's a couple out at the moment. Jump bridges, we can use them to get around quickly, knowing where they are and knowing where the enemies are is very good information for you to know. Cloaky warfare and black op. Those of you who have been running with Isbad over the past few days and weeks will probably have a lot more knowledge about this than many others. But again, much like leading a normal fleet, there's a lot of logistics involved. There's a lot of deciding what you're going to do, where you're going to go, who you're going to shoot. And you'll interact with Black Ops a lot, whether you like it or not. 
Tied into that, we have stealth bomber fleets. Now, those of you who were in Catatonic Dawn's fleet the other day are all too aware of how effective stealth bombers can be to deal with. So your ability to counter stealth bombers or to bear them in mind or use them yourself and coordinating with friendly bombers in a fight while advanced is something you will need to learn at some point in the future. And more often than not, you will pick up on this over time either from other FCs or from running into it yourself. This kind of information is often best experienced rather than taught, which is why it's not in here. And of course, capital ships. Capital ships are a whole different ball game. Do not even think about leading capital ships yet if you've never led a fleet. Don't even put it in your mind, but put it into your mind anyway because it's here. So in the future, you may well get involved with capital ships. You might not be leading them. They might be supporting your fleet, perhaps. You might be fighting them. But capital ships are a very real thing in EVE. Now, as to you, the FC, how can you get better? Well, things I expect from good FCs, note, not amazing FCs, but good FCs. Your ability to quickly snap call. So to rapid fire, change target, shoot X, no, shoot Y, now shoot Z, shoot A, B, C, D, as stuff dies. Your ability to quickly analyze and call targets effectively is something that you can only improve on. Your knowledge of doctrines, so what doctrine does what, what it's good at, how it can be countered, whether or not your doctrine can counter that doctrine, whether that doctrine can counter your doctrine. This is all stuff you want to learn over time. There is not a guide anywhere in EVE which will say caracals are good against X, Y, Z. Because quite frankly, that guide would A, be 3,000 pages long, and B, would be completely dependent on who's leading each fleet. Okay? So you will get a basic feel for what can count a what or how you can achieve particular objectives against other doctrines. Mass intel sorting. Scouts, I mentioned earlier, obviously they feed you information. There will be a point in the future if you lead large fleets where you will be fed a lot of information. Different fleets moving around, particularly if you're leading strategic operations, you might have information coming from six or seven different places. Eventually, you'll be at a point where you can effectively sort that information and prioritize it based on what you need now. This is not something that you will start being able to do, much like anything. Your ability to multitask, again, will improve over time. It can be a bit of a struggle in large fleets to keep on top of target calling, moving, you know, keeping an eye on how many ships the enemy have. Are there more ships coming in? Do you have more ships coming in? Are there chats giving you intel? Are there other targets on grid coming in? This is all stuff you will improve at sorting out. So again, when you're starting out, do not be afraid. It will be a little bit overwhelming, a little bit confusing. You will improve. And of course, your ability to micro and macro manage. So those of you who have played RTSs might be a bit more familiar with this term. Micromanage is more, you know, overheating, prop mods on or off, controlling individual actions of your ships. So you tell your fleet, overheat guns, overheat guns, or prop mods on, prop mods off. Your ability to quickly call that on the fly as you need, that will get better over time. And likewise, your ability to see the bigger picture, macro management, your big fleet movements, your big warps, fleets across multiple systems, all of this kind of thing, you will get better. You will learn how to do it, as long as you are willing to learn how to do it. And finally, guys, last one I honest, the resources you have. So I said before, you can talk to any of us, any of the FCs, anybody else around in Horde, stop by, have a chat, ask questions. More than happy to help you. But we have additional resources available. So we run a Skybeans program, which you can find information about on the forums. Skybeans is basically experienced fleet commanders posted up. We'll say like on Wednesday at 8 o'clock eve time, we have a Skybeans roam. You step up as the Skybean FC, as we call it. And what basically happens is we give you ships. We give you a whole bunch of ships. We give you 50, 60 ships to give out to people to come on your fleet. Towers, cormorants, you pick. And then we backseat you. We sit with you on the fleet. We sit with you in the command channel. We help you along. You lead the fleet. We're there to help if you need it. You can stop, ask for questions. We can advise as you go. 
we can teach you along the way. On top of Skybeans, we obviously have handouts in NBI. So in bigger fleets, you notice we often hand out some ships. Ospreys are a good example. We hand out repair ships to encourage people to fly them. That is there for you. Even as a newbie in FC, you can talk to any NBI dude and you can find them on Discord. They've got yellow name tags. And just ask, hey, I'm about to lead a fleet. Are there any ships you can give me to hand out? Of course, we've got other FCs. Me, TJL3, we've got people like Travis Kakira, Calitonic Dawn, Avram Diaz, Willem Crane, all sorts of FCs, people you see leading fleets all the time. Don't be afraid to ask them questions. Obviously, don't do it while they're busy. You know, if they're leading another fleet, maybe that's not the best time to pop down and have a chat. But when they're free, you know, hey, Travis, we saw you doing this earlier. Can you give me some more advice on that? Or, hey, TGL, I want to take out a Rome. Can you suggest some ships for me? Can you help me? Put a foreign post up. Can you help me ping once I put the fleet up? Can you backseat me? Can you come with me on this fleet and help me out? Absolutely. All you need to do is ask. Horde Square as well. You're using it at the moment. So while I would advise clicking on it now, because it might take you off the page, if you look on the left-hand side, there is a help section. And in that help section, you will find all sorts of gifts and guides on all sorts of things you can do in the client and in the game. I would advise, if you haven't already, have a look through these. You may learn a surprising number of things about how the game operates that will help you lead fleets. And of course, within there, there's image references and all sorts. We also run other classes. So obviously, this being an FC 101 class, there are other classes we have run. I myself have run a class on stealth bombing. There is another class that you can watch the recording of under flight school on the left which is moving around safely in New Eden, which you might find quite useful for navigational purposes. And there will be many other classes going up in the future. On that note, if you think you have what it takes to lead a class or come up with yourself, do it. There is a thread on the forums. If you wish me to, I can link it in Mumble later on. And you can create your own class presentation and lead it just as I am now. Nice and easy. There's no strict requirements. Just tell Cal that you've got this class, you want to run it, and he will walk you through the process of setting it up just like we did today. So if you've got an area of expertise, maybe it's mining, maybe it's industry, you want to tell Beans how to build stuff, go for it. And finally, there is a couple of lectures that Avrin Diaz has done previously. You can find the links to them there, they're both YouTube links. One is similar to the conversation today in Introduction to FCA, and the second one is Combat Probing, which from our conversation today about probing, you might find useful to pursue. And as always, this class itself will remain on Horde Square. The slides will remain there for you to look at and look through. And I believe this class is being recorded and will also be on YouTube if you wish to look over it. And of course, if you have any questions, you can go ahead and ask them now within the chat system and I will answer them all now. So let's have a look. Are outrageous Scottish accents accepted? Yes, so long as we can understand you. Are you here now, Mr. Scottish person? On comms, if not, don't worry, I was going to judge your accent. But yes, as long as people as a whole can understand you, yes, your Scottish accent is fine. Other than Dotland, are the other pages are absolutely useful for FCing? Yes. And no. Uh, so Dotline is one of your best tools because it's your navigational device. It's your map. It's your compass. The only other tool that you may consistently use as a fleet commander is your D-scan and local scan tool. And I will put a link to that on Mumble in a moment. So those of you who have probably seen it, you can get to it from the Pandemic Legion forums. There is a tab at the top next to activity saying scan tools. And what that lets you do is that lets you copy and paste a directional scan result. And it gives you a link which you can link to other people to show you what ships are on directional scan. Your scouts will use this a lot. They will give you a descan link of what's in the area. But on top of that, a lot of the information is just you taking whatever people give you and putting it all together into a plan of action.
When calling out targets, what is better to use in terms of identifying targets in your overview? That can be a mess sometimes. Yes, absolutely. So your ability to parse and identify what's on field and what is happening is another skill. And it will also depend on how you have set up your client. So everybody's got their own preference on how that overview is set up, how their modules are laid out, how zoomed in they are, what brackets they've got on, and everything like that. So here's what I do, okay? On my overview, I will only show enemy ships, and I will sort by distance, okay? This lets me see what's close. I will then zoom quite far out, and I will be showing on my brackets, so the little squares in space, enemy, basically all ships. So purple fleet ships, green corp ships, blue alliance ships, and red or blank enemy and neutral ships. So what I can effectively do is looking through my overview, I can identify what's close in terms of range, or I can sort by type and look for key targets. Examples of this include what we discussed earlier, enemy logistics, enemy electronic warfare. That will let you pick out ship types. And then by looking, by zooming all the way out in the middle, you can then obviously see the field as a whole where people are related to each other. And if you haven't already, the tactical camera they put in a few months ago, which is Alt-1 by default, lets you right-click and pan the camera and detach it from your ship, which is extremely helpful for moving your camera around and seeing what's close to what. But yes, in terms of calling out targets, yeah, identify them however you can is the short answer. You know, if you find it easier to just use the overview to pick things out, that's, that's you, you know. Some people don't use the on-screen map at all or very little. Some people just use the overview to find what they want to find. I use a mix. Some people might not use the overview at all. There's no real 100% guaranteed way for you to do that. It's all up to you. You'll figure that out pretty quickly once you've been in a few fights. And any lectures recorded so far for pieces I missed. Um, obviously, if you were late into this one, the entire thing will be recorded. Otherwise, if you look on Flight School on the left, any classes recorded will have a YouTube link for them in there as well. And on top of that, on Horde's YouTube channel, we have quite a few bits of information and pieces on there as well. And if you haven't already, we have an information and guide section on our Horde forums, an entire sub-forum. People post all sorts of cool information in there. Lectures, written guide, visual guides, infographics. If you haven't taken the time to yet at least have a look through that sub form, you might well be impressed by what you find. But in all honesty, guys, that's it. A very basic overview to what you need to know and what you need to bear in mind. Now, all things considered here, it's not quite as complicated as it might appear. Get out there, lead some people, learn by doing. People don't learn sitting in classrooms, they learn by going out. But hopefully what I've spoken to you about today gives you a little bit more information on what is involved and the kind of things you need to bear in mind to keep your guys alive and the enemy guys very dead. So, are there any further questions? If not, we will end it here, I think.